Well, good morning. It's been a while since I've been up here. And as is the case every time I'm up here after a while, I see lots of faces that I don't recognize. Um, Pastor Patton had sort of anticipated that, and so part of what he's asked me to do is give a little bit of a history as to the church planning and specifically Covenant's role in church planning over the past, it's been 10 years now. Now, there's going to be a little tiny bit of a reversal today for what I would normally do. Normally, I would open up with sort of a I don't know, theology, philosophy, sort of underlying foundation to why we church plant, how we church plant, those sorts of things. Um, however, um, my message today that I'm going to be delivering will be covering that, why we plant churches, what the point of that is, and how we go. Um, the one is, again, just the involvement that Covenant has had, the, the treasure and people and time and effort that Covenant has been putting into church planning for the last decade. But then secondly, as we walk through each one of these projects that has happened over the last 10 years, you're going to be learning something about not just the process in general, but all lots of different ways in which this process can take place, different ways in which it can start, different ways in which it can be overseen and continue. So let's begin with Springfield. For us as Covenant, Springfield is where it all began. This was back in 2011, 2012. At that time, we had seven different families that were part of Covenant's uh, congregation that were driving in from Springfield. Um, I'd say on average, each of those families were here together about five years being part of Covenant's body life. But all the while expressing the desire, hey, someday we would like to not drive 35, 40 minutes to church, and someday we would like to see our community in Springfield have the same kind of church that Vandalia now has. And so Springfield is almost a textbook example of the mother-daughter church planting relationship. That is where we had a core group of people within our own congregation who were coming from another place, who were desirous of having a new Orthodox Presbyterian church over where they were. And what happened then is we already had a ready-made core group. We already had a group of families with which to begin this project. They were already signed up. They were just ready for us as covenant as a session to move. Um, One of the other elements that differs from church plant to church plant is the way that the church plant is governed, how it's overseen. Again, Springfield's a nice textbook case of an overseeing session from the mother church. So there was a period where covenant session was overseeing what was going on at covenant, and they were also overseeing the church plant that was going on in Springfield. That's part of the mother-daughter relationship. The next thing that a church plant generally needs, if they've got a core group and they have an overseeing session, is an organizing pastor. An organizing pastor is a minister who comes in usually on a temporary basis, period of four years or so, and walks that core group through the process of moving from a mission work to becoming a particular church. Um, having them grow their own leadership from inside, having them get to the point where they're financially self-supporting, Um, getting them to the point where they're already engaged in ministry and the community in which they're living. Now, with respect to um, Springfield, we had, again, a built-in organizing pastor. Um, Sinman and I had been members here, I forget how many years, maybe about nine years by the time that we started looking at the Springfield church plant. The session, especially Charles had asked me, hey, would this be something you would be interested in doing? I'd said, well, yeah, if I can go to seminary first and Covenant provided me with an internship, uh, the bulk of which was my working myself through seminary, also ministering here a bit. So we had, again, even a homegrown organizing pastor for Springfield. And so we began with evening worship. Actually, we began with a Bible study. We did a Bible study for a year, attempting to grow that core group to the point where they could become a mission work. That mission work began worshiping in evenings. They did that for a year. In the meantime, we had Um, Daniel Dolis, who was here, also a seminary grad, we brought him onto our session, covenant session, with a specific purpose of sending him with me. Most guys don't like me to be on the ground by myself. They want somebody watching what I'm doing, which is not a bad move. So Daniel was able to come with me, at which point that work moved to Sunday morning worship. And then in 2017, while I was still there as organizing pastor, we brought them to the place of particularization. That is where they become their own church, they have their own finances, they have their own elders. And at that point, Daniel became the permanent pastor, and then we moved on as covenant looking for the, the next project 
to work on. So that's the, again, sort of typical textbook mother-daughter church planting relationship. Core group from one church that goes out under the oversight of the elders of that church that sends them out. The unique function was having our own organizing pastor that went with them, got them started, and, um, but then we would supply with them with elders. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, I can. I can. Why don't you speak to it generally, and then I'll, I'll tell you why it wasn't applicable in that particular case. It was. Yeah. Yes. And that's on top of the normal sort of support that they would get. Yes. Um, I'll move on from there. If you'd like to know why we didn't do it, I can tell you afterwards. <laughs> no, no, that's perfect. That's perfect. And again, in, li- in light of the email that went out to you all recently, that- that's another reason I'm walking through each one of these projects in this process, so you can kind of get an idea of what the steps are and different ways of, of going about it. So that was-, that was perfectly appropriate. Okay. All right. Right as... Springfield was becoming a particular church, we had a different model arise. And this was a model of 10 families that were already meeting together, calling and just saying, hey, we want to be an OPC church. That's, that's a softball. Um, the overseeing structure was a little bit different that time in that rather than have one overseeing session from one church, what we did as a presbytery was we put together a number of elders from different places, different churches, guys who um, maybe had a little more time, a little more experience with church planting, brought them together as a committee, and they oversaw that church. Now, um, another sort of unique feature of the Wilmington church plant is that we gave them, Covenant gave them, a free year of their evangelist. So I was actually there on the ground for a year, preaching for them as they searched for an organizing pastor. Um, And while we were in between church plants of our own, well, we weren't in between for very long, as the next story will tell. Um, So we had a group that just called and said, we want to be an OPC church. We put together a structure of a session from different men from local churches. Um, We gave them a free year of the evangelist from Covenant. And then eventually they were able to call their own organizing pastor. That relationship did not go well. Um, That organizing pastor moved on to another call, and I was able to step back in as ministerial advisor. I was providing pulpit supply for them. Um, But what happened to that church was, even without a pastor, they they had strong candidates for elders and for deacons. We moved forward with training them and certifying them and electing them and installing them, And that church became a particular church even without a pastor. They still have no pastor. They have a candidate now who's working his way through the candidates and credentials um, process. And right now he is uh, providing stated supply for for Wilmington. So that's been um, a lightening of of my load. I don't have to go down there every Sunday any longer. But our hope is is that his exams will go well um, and that in the spring um, he will be, his ordination from the denomination he's coming from will be transferred into the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. What happens at that point is the denomination and the presbytery were funding that work as long as there is an organizing pastor on the ground. What happened was when the organizing pastor went on to another call, that, that uh, support was paused. And then as soon as we have a man back on the ground there, even though the church is already particularized, that support will recommence, and then they'll have, I think, another, another two years. Now, normally what happens with funding from the denomination is that you start out with a lot that's coming from the denomination and very little that's coming from the, the group, the core group that's on the ground. And then every three months, that ratio changes a bit until we get to the end of the process, and the hope is, again, that the congregational giving has made up for everything that they've been losing every three-month increment from denominational support. So you're kind of weaning them off denominational support and towards self-sufficiency financially. 
And so Wilmington's in a place where they still had some of that left. The denomination really actually has a good amount of funds right now, the denomination does. And so they're encouraging churches, look, if you, if you broke off your support, even if you're particularized, continue, and we'll continue supporting it. So again, the denomination and the presbytery, very, very generous and extremely helpful in that way. All right, the next project, sort of historically, and now we're kind of coming into the, the realm of the present a bit as well, was Dayton. Um, you might remember me telling the story the first time, is when my son Braden was going to Sinclair Community College, and I was dropping him off a couple days a week, and I was just noticing all of this renewed activity um, downtown. Oh, I completely skipped one, kind of. I'll give the backstory here. Um, Before that, we had sort of looked at the map and said, what are we we looking at target-wise? Springfield's wrapping up. We want to keep doing this. We like the way this has worked. Um, And we were looking at first out in western um, Montgomery County, New Lebanon, West Alexandria, out in that area. Um, For that one, yes, this is where I should tell the story. For that one, we had a little bit different model. That one was rather than having one core group from one church or just one group that just came in already formed, I started recruiting from Covenant with the session's permission and recruiting also from Redeemer with their session's permission as well and said, here's where we're looking on the map. Here's where, where we think some opportunities are. We know that you have families living over here. We know that you have families living over there. Can we talk about forming a core group that we would then turn into a mission work, that we would then turn into a, um, a particularized church? So Covenant Session met with Redeemer Session. We kind of talked through the details of that, and uh, we moved out. We started evening worship out in New Lebanon. It was at this point when my ADD kicked in, and I was taking Braden down to downtown Dayton for Sinclair and realized, wait, there's... There's growth. At the time, I think within an 18-month period, the population downtown had increased by 90%. There were new businesses going in, new restaurants, new coffee shops, new bars, um, lots of new housing, um, warehouses being taken over and um, transferred into housing, new housing being built. And I said, we have got, at first it was, this is what we need to do next. We need to get out in front of this. I tell this joke every time I tell the story. The OPC is not known for getting out in front of things, generally. But I thought, we've got an opportunity here. We can, we can do this. Well, uh, my ADD and my impatience sort of worked together um, for me to approach Covenant Session and say, look, we're working on this out in the West. It's okay. We're out in a, a 4,000, um, a population of 4,000 little place. There are people in the rural areas that we can pull into this. But this is what we've got that looks like it's going on right now. In, in downtown Dayton. So then, with the session's encouragement, I approached the other families and said, I know this is what we've been looking at, but what would you guys think about this? We had five families at the time who were meeting regularly. Um, four of them said, let's do it. One of them said, we're not all that interested, we'll just stay at Covenant, and here they still are. So we didn't lose a family, they just, they, they remained here. So what we did then is that was when I um, sort of renewed my communications to Redeemer session and said, hey, we're actually moving downtown now. Um, Do you have other folks that you think would be interested in in joining us in that? And we had new families that came from Redeemer, and then we had new families that started coming from from other churches. Um, On the front end, our our focus was on, I, I had been doing, um, I had been doing outreach to the atheist and skeptic communities at the time. That's part of what I had started um, when we started Springfield, um, that was put on hold while I was organizing pastor of Springfield. We had renewed that with the start of Light of the Nations downtown. We were, we were having regular meetings. We were working through different books um, together. We had a small group of unbelievers and skeptics that were coming. Um, but that was, that was the ministry focus on the front end of that church plant. Um, what happened then... So we, that's, that was the, the dual core. We had two groups of people that f- formed the main core and then other people who were added over time. Um, I, who at that point had sort of been an in-between guy, we had, we had said, all right, you did an organizing pastor job in Springfield, that's fine, but maybe we can switch to where you're just getting the thing started and then as a matter of course, we'll bring in a, another organizing pastor, not like Springfield where I was the guy all the way through. I was so excited about Dayton that I thought, I want to be the organizing pastor of this guy, of this, of this, of this place. So we had kind of switched gears on that. We started as a mission work. I was organizing pastor of that. And then the denomination ruined everything. 
Because there's another way in which the denomination is very generous in their funding, and that is they will fund interns. They will, they will split the cost of an intern 50-50 with you. And the denomination called me and said, we have an intern that is interested in ending up in Ohio. We think you'd be a good fit for what you're doing. Um, and this is Tyler Dietrich. So Tyler came out. I was maybe six months into my organizing pastorate at the downtown church. I had one conversation with him, and I realized I was going to lose my job. Um, so he came in right around the time of COVID, which was crazy. He was there. He was supposed to be there for a one-year internship. Um, nine months in, the, the writing was on the wall, and we realized that he was a very good fit for that particular congregation. And so we moved forward to actually call him. He replaced me as organizing pastor. Um, his, his election, um, the vote to call him was, was lots of fun. Um, when I, I remember when I collected all the ballots, I said, okay, I read the results. I said, we've got, um, we've got 10 yeses. We've got three yeses with exclamation points. And we have one yes with three exclamation points. People raised their hands. They're like, I didn't realize we could do extra exclamation points. So again, they were not sad to see me go, partly because I wasn't, well, I don't, I don't know, partly because I wasn't actually going. Um, what happened at that point then is I remained on at Light of the Nations, and we started focusing on the international outreach out of Light of the Nations. One of the things that I, I try to do as we're starting new church plants, and you'll hear more about this in the, in the message this morning, um, Every church plant is made up of different kinds of people, meeting in a different kind of place, with different kinds of opportunities around them. And so what we try to do from the beginning is say, okay, who are we? What are our skill sets? What are our interests? What's happening right around us? And how do we custom tailor our outreach ministry to, to that particular circumstance? Now, Light of the Nations, which was not Light of the Nations, it was First Street Reformed because we were meeting on First Street on the west side, um, as we were working through ideas, one person pointed out, they said, you know, everyone who's living within half a mile of here, maybe it was a quarter mile, everyone who's living within a quarter mile of here has one thing in common. I said, what's that? Like, they're all incarcerated. So we were very close to the, the county buildings and the jail and all those sorts of things. The other thing that we were very close to, and this, this entered our mind as a serious consideration at what point, there's some significant Section 8 housing, which is just a couple of blocks from where we were. We had, we had sometimes severely, and usually at least moderately, ment mentally challenged and um, mentally ill people who were finding us, who were coming in, and we had several of them that were regular, regular attenders. And so at one point, we're thinking about that. This is where we're at. This is what's going on. Is how, do we, how do we focus our ministry on, on these folks? who are obviously very, very needy spiritually. So what ended up happening, though, as we started looking at um, English as a second language, we started looking also at the community and realized that a lot of the population growth downtown was immigrant. It was refugee. It was, um, it was people even just moving from other places in the United States. Actually, we were really shocked when we started looking at the numbers of the, the saturation downtown. Um, some of the abandoned what had been abandoned neighborhoods in the downtown area have, have been completely revitalized by the importation of just about entire populations. And what caught our attention at first was a large group of what we call Ahishkan Turks. Um, these were Turks that had been spread out through the Soviet empire over the past couple of decades. They've been regathering, kind of reconstituting their identity, their connection with one another. And about 12 years ago, 500 of these families moved to Old North Dayton in mass. And so that was one of the populations that we were looking at. Um, the Hispanic population downtown has, has been significantly increasing as well. So as we were renting space, as we were looking around, as we were trying to determine ministry focus, we sort of fell on an international ministry focus, which also then played in to where we were looking for a building. Um, we had a 36,000 square foot building most of you have been to. Um, pop-up for sale. It was being sold by an organization that um, supports church planting. Um, they made us a really, really fabulous deal. As soon as we got to the point where we were comfortable with a building in which we were still getting lost, 
um, and tried to think through how can we make use of this space, what other groups can we bring in. That's where we, that's where we officially sort of chose our direction as being a church that focuses on outreach to the international community. Our particular neighborhood at Light of the Nations right now is 30% Hispanic. And again, right across the river by Children's Hospital, you've got a large Turkish community. So at that point, we did that for a while. Light of the Nations particularized. We had our own elders. We had our own permanent pastor. And I stayed on there. So what happened at that point was my role shifted from being covenants evangelist to being home-based out of light of the nations. Another thing that happened there is that the denomination and the presbytery started looking at what covenant was doing, at what was happening in the Dayton area. And we had begun to develop a track record where they were comfortable funding me on a permanent basis. Oftentimes the funding will only come in when you have an organizing pastor who's on the ground. But the denomination is very responsive when they see a church that is pursuing church planting and, and pursuing different kinds of ministries of coming in and saying, what, what do you need? How can we help? And how can we, how can we fund this? So at the particularization of Light of the Nations, that's what happened with us, is that they've funded me full-time and, and permanently. So my support from the denomination is no longer dependent on whether or not we have an active mission work going on. Two ministries that developed out of Light of the Nations founding um, as part of the international focus. The first one, well, the first one chronologically, I would say, is our, our Quran Bible study. Um, this, we are into our third year of that now. And this is, um, this is some folks from the Turkish community that I mentioned earlier. Um, there's, I would say, 10 different men that come. This is every other week, um, probably six at a time. We've got usually four to five or six of us from a lot of the nations who are there. We, we take turns the one week I'm presenting out of the Gospel of Luke, the next week they're presenting out of the Quran, and we have um, discussion, just super warm, loving relationships that are developing around that. Um, definitely count them among, among our friends. Um, but we are, we're certainly engaged in the long game with this one. Um, every once in a while you, you'll feel like you've, you've sort of made an inroad and made a point and the lights have come on and then you come back in two weeks, and it's like all of the work that you had done before and all the progress you thought you had made is just restarting. But, but these, these friends are willing to continue engaging. And it's, I, I, I know I've mentioned this in the past, but one of, the, um, one of the most difficult things with this group for the first 18 months was persuading them how vast and how significant were the differences between the Christian faith in Islam. This particular group is, is very, they're very open, they're very engaging, they're very like religious dialogue, and they're really all about showing all the points of commonality between the different faiths. And so I had to be that guy for 18 months, and they would say, oh, this isn't, we have this in common, this in common. I would say, yes, but here's what we don't, and this is a matter of life and death, and it's not just a trivial detail, it's important, it's the core of the, of the difference. And I remember um, one of the, the high points, again, this was about 18 months into this ministry, one of the high points where I really felt like God was moving is when one of the, one of the gentlemen looked at me and he pointed his finger at me and he said, what you just said is blasphemy. And I said, he's hearing me. <laughs> he's getting it. He's understanding what we're saying about Jesus. And he's understanding that we're saying Jesus is not just like one of the prophets. He's not just, he's, he is the son of God. We are... The, the Quranic sin that we are committing is associating partners with God. And we say, yes, that is exactly what we are doing. We are saying that this man, Jesus Christ, is the eternal son of God, has always been God. And so, again, that was a point of progress where it was like, oh, okay, this is, this is a difference. Um, we had a, a, our, I think, most recent meeting once again. We kept coming back to where they say, well, you know, you're, you guys are okay because your faith, you're following your book. And I have to keep coming back and saying, your book says that what I believe is going to send me to hell. Our book says the same thing about what you believe. Let's, I mean, we really have to walk away from this, you know, I'm okay, you're okay, isn't this great, how we all believe there's, there are holy books and prophets. So I, I, I foresee that ministry continuing for the next 20 years. I wouldn't mind if it stopped in five when they all converted and, and joined the church. But even then... 
even then, I don't think that that would stop. I think it would, there would just be more people that we, we try to bring into that. So that, that's just been incredibly encouraging. Every time I walk away from that, I just pinch myself. What did we just do? What did we just have the opportunity to do? It's, it's really fabulous. It's really great. Um, so the other thing um, is our English as a Second Language ministry that's going on out of Dayton, out of the Light of the Nations. And this is one that I think has at least as many, if not more, covenant people who are, have been and are now presently involved in making it go. So this is another thing that I really like about planting churches close to churches is the opportunity that provides for cooperation in, in ministry together. And so this, this has been an example of that. Um, every Tuesday night, we have um, two sections of class with a break in the middle with a Bible lesson out of the verse. Um, in between, um, last year, we had 175 different students come through the program. It's been a little bit um, lighter. I probably have had 50 different students this first half of, of the school year. Um, but again, very warm relationships. Um, we've had the opportunity several times to um, provide diaconate support to some of the folks who, who have come. Um, we had one family at Light of the Nations. There was a, a, a young lady who was in a pretty difficult situation, took, took her into their house. She ended up living with them for three or four months. Um, so that's, that's, that's been wonderful as well. Um, okay, bridging a gap. Um, as part of the ESL ministry, we can teach English only knowing English. We can teach English not knowing the native language of the people who come. And at the, at the beginning, we had Spanish, we had Vietnamese, we had Ukrainian, um, we had some Mandarin speakers at the beginning. Um, by the end of our first year, we were 95 by the very end of our first year, not 100% Spanish speaking. Now that's changed recently as we've had a, a contingent of Ukrainians. Um, we've had probably eight different Ukrainian students who have come. We have three who are regular and one right now who comes from time to time. But in general, the population that we were serving with this ministry was Spanish speaking. And while you can teach English without knowing the, the native language of the people you're dealing with, it's, you cannot do pastoral ministry. Um, you can do some evangelism as long as it's scripted and they don't ask questions, you don't understand what they're asking. And so it became, it became pretty clear at the end of the first year that someone was going to have to have a little bit at least of the language. If nothing else, just be putting forth uh, a, good for, a good faith effort so they know that, that you're trying. And actually it's, it's really helpful too while you're teaching English and when you try to speak their language and you fail and they see, okay, <laughs> We, we can do this. If this moron can get up there and just do what he did, then I can try to practice, practice this sentence. So that's been encouraging. But again, it, was, it became clear two things, that somebody there needed to know Spanish better than anybody did, um, and that I in particular needed to learn more than I had because I was the one primarily interfacing with these folks. And so summer before last, I went to Costa Rica for a six-month just introductory crash course um, language, an intensive language course. Um, I knew it wasn't, I knew I wasn't going to come back, you know, writing poetry or, you know, extemporaneous speeching, but speech. But I did know that I would at least gain enough of the language um, to be able to present lessons that, you know, that I had written um, and that it was going to be kind of a jump start to what I hoped to acquire in, in greater acquisitional or um, conversational skill with that. So I planned to go to Costa Rica. We set that up. And in the meantime, I was contacted by Living Water, our first church plant in Springfield. I want you to see how all these things keep coming back full circle. When I was there at Living Water, this is back in 2016 still, we were approached by a group of um, members of the National Presbyterian Church of Mexico. Raise your hand if you've heard of that. A 1.1 million member confessional Presbyterian denomination in Mexico. Um, I was a little less surprised because a couple years earlier, the OPC had joined fraternal relations, full fraternal relations with the Brazilian Presbyterian Church, which was being reported at the time of having 2.7 million members. Um, the PCA and the OPC combined have about 330,000 members, just, just for perspective on that. So 
there was an elder from that church who was living in Springfield, who was gathering, ministering to different people, Spanish-speaking people in Springfield. They approached us. They knew a little bit about the OPC. They had been meeting in an EPC church, which was further down the road. Most of the people to whom he was ministering were living in Springfield. So they approached us and asked if they could use our space in our building for prayer meetings and worship services. We were, we were fine with that. We were really excited about that. This was when Living Water was in its first building that we were just renting. Um, we were there Sunday mornings. They were there Friday nights, Saturday afternoons, and then Sundays and Sunday mornings before us, and then Sunday afternoons after us. They were really making use of the building. Um, I began forming a relationship with the elder. He began taking me on pastoral visits. Again, I had enough Spanish to know that it wasn't English being spoken, but really not much more than that at the time. But again, forming the relations with him, um, I um, performed a wedding through a translator for two members of their group. Um, We particularized the living water. I left. That group continued meeting. At some time into their history, that group of people was officially recognized by the National Presbyterian Church of Mexico, not as a church, but as a mission work might be the right, the right term for it. I'm not exactly sure. But they were given oversight by a pastor from Chiapas. Now, Chiapas, Mexico is the southernmost province of Mexico. It's as far as you can go in Mexico and not, and not be in Central America, Central America, or South America, I should say. Um, he comes up once a year, does membership interviews, administers the sacraments, and administers pastoral care to these people once, once a year. So what was happening over the years is that as this group was there, we were encouraging lightly, but just reminding them, we would be very, very willing to take you in as a mission work and give you on-site, direct, immediate pastoral oversight. Um, that, that discussion happened a couple of times, didn't go very far, um, until Living Water hired um, another church planting internship, thanks to the generosity of the denomination intern, um, James Stafford, who was good in Spanish, fluent in Spanish. He came in, and he was there for a year, and he took over um, the pastoral care and the preaching for that group. And our hope was that at the end of that call, that he would stay on and that, that he would take that group in the direction of a mission work and into a, a particularized church. Um, he took a call elsewhere, and so Living Water approached me and said, hey, help us find a guy. And I said, okay, I'll do that. I said, but here's, here's an idea in the meantime while I'm looking. I said, I'm about to go to Costa Rica. Um, I know I'm not going to come back fluent, but I think my goal, I, my hope, is that I can come back with the ability to read a sermon, which I, I know is insufficient, but it's, it's something. It's more than they would, would be getting. Um, he said, okay, um, let's, let's talk to the group about it. Let's talk to James about it. So we all met together. I explained sort of what I was doing in Dayton, the reason I was going for language training, what I was offering. And again, I, I still don't know much Spanish. I didn't at the time, but I knew enough to know that they were not impressed with the idea. I, you know, I, I, knew, I knew enough to, to hear the kind of concerns that they, <laughs> they were expressing. And I, and I said, you know, and we can try it. I can do one week. And if they don't like it, they can go back to having no one. And that might be preferable. I, I acknowledge that as a possibility. Um, so, so I went. I, I, I came back after six weeks. Um, I remember, I've done a lot of, I don't know, not very well thought out things in my ministerial career. But I remember walking the green mile up to the pulpit the first time, thinking, okay, that, that's, that's too far. Like, you, you have, now you've done it. What are you doing? <laughs> You're about to get up and preach a sermon in a language you don't know. And I, I was, oh. So this first one, the first one I had, I had, um, I had written, I had uh, translated using Google Translator. I had sent it to people who spoke Spanish. I asked them to help me, you know, make corrections, and I had practiced it over and over and over again. I'm still uh, very, very frightened. I get up, and I can, I can see them like, and uh, so I start, and about five minutes in, I see them go, looking at each other like, we can actually understand what he's saying. And uh, so that was very encouraging 
after the, after the first time doing that. It got much, much less, less encouraging as we went forward. Um, there, there are two sort of man, uh, main families. Um, one of the families, eight siblings, literally grew up in a hut with a dirt floor. Um, their particular region of, of Mexico, um, extremely poverty-stricken. These are a very, very reserved people. Just not, I mean, I, I thought, you know, Presbyterians are Presbyterians, but Mexican Presbyterians will be different. No, they're, they're still Presbyterians, you know. The old Babylon Bee story, you know, um, motion sensor lights go off during Presbyterian worship kind of thing. Um, so what I realized was how dependent I was in my preaching on some kind of response from the audience. I would work in a joke here or there. Nothing. And I was like, oh, this is terrible. This is really terrible. So one of them, um, one of them was married to a North American woman, and um, she, was, she was with child, um, so she wasn't there all the time. But one Sunday, she was finally there, and I sat down, and I said, look, I, I, I need something from you. She's like, how can I help you? I said, I need to know whether they hate me or not. I said, I, 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 said, I don't know whether it would be better for you to have somebody just get up and talk. I, I don't know. I can't tell. I was like, I tell jokes. They don't laugh. I make what I think are great points. There's no response. Like, I just, I just don't even know. If you, if you ask them and they say that they would rather me not come, I'm, I'm actually, I'm more than fine with that. Um, and she said, she said, okay, let me tell you something. She's a fairly reserved person herself. She said, I've been, she said, I've been married to this, to this man four years. I've been in this group for four years. She goes, I've seen them laugh as a group one time, just once. She said, and that was someone from their province. She said, they've had other, you know, Spanish-speaking ministers, and they, they're just, so I said, okay, can you please, though, can you please ask them? Like, just make sure, because <laughs> I don't mind not coming back. I feel like they'd be too embarrassed to ask me not to come back. So please open that door. She's like, I, I, I think it's fine. She's like, I, under, I understand your Spanish fine. She's like, I don't think there's any problem with the language. She said, but I'll, I'll ask. I said, okay, thank you. So I went home licking my wounds because it was a particularly bad day. And I came the next week and they were all. <laughs> and I thought, all right, somebody's had a pep talk. <laughs> So that was encouraging. And then since then, I mean, my, my language has improved a little bit. Um, I'm still very, very, very nervous about engaging conversationally just because, I don't know if you've ever tried to learn a language, but here's what happens. is you know three phrases, you throw them out, and the person's like, this person knows Spanish. And you're just like, Hi. you lost me in the first syllable. So just I'm um, sort of proud, and I don't want to look like an idiot, so I don't engage in conversation, but I've been... Doing, doing better about that. Actually, about three weeks ago, I walked out, and there was the, the group of fellows who were, were standing around, and I just walked up to them, and I said, hey, you guys, just keep talking. I just need to just listen to a little bit of Spanish while you talk. So they were talking, and um, I had, earlier in the meeting, had this young lady um, translate for me something that I needed to say to the group that I wanted to make sure they understood, and they asked me, how, um, how, the, how did she do as a translator? And I said, well, <laughs> I don't really know Spanish, so I don't know how she did. It sounded fine. I said, based on some of the comments I think I heard, I feel like she communicated the, the idea. And they said, yeah, um, you know, it's, it's really a lot easier for the younger people because they're in school. They have to do it, and they have the opportunity to practice all day. And uh, he said, you know, we need, we need English classes. And I said, well, you know, we've got them going on at, in, in Dayton. And he said, yeah, but I live in Columbus. And um, I said, you know, we've got Ukrainian students that are coming now. And I said, their language is really hard. They said, why is it really complicated? And I said, no, 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 there's just really hard sounds to make. And all of a sudden I realized I had done the whole thing in Spanish, that whole conversation. Now, that was, that was a one-off. I mean, that hardly ever happens. But it was, I was like, okay, <laughs> this is possible for my almost 49-year-old brain. It's taking a long, long, long time. But there's, there's at least been progress. But the more important and most exciting progress is finding a replacement. This was, for the last 18 months, this was like the biggest thing in my mind is I, we, you know, I, can, I can grow in my language. I cannot, the, the trajectory is not right. I will not be able to pick up enough language to help this group in the time in which they need the help. So I had been talking to the nomination 
I had been talking to the PCA, I had been talking to all sorts of different people saying, I need, I need somebody who's bilingual who can come and, and take this work over for us. Um, and so I found a Brazilian who speaks Portuguese, which is close to Spanish. Um, Jefferson de Oliveira is a um, minister. He's ordained in the Presbyterian Church of Brazil. He has done Spanish language ministry in Paraguay. Um, he is part now of a, a Spanish-speaking group. He is in Westminster, California, finishing up a second master's in theology, mostly which he's doing in order to improve his theological English, to improve his English. He has a particular vision for ministering to both halves of the immigrant community. One of the things that we see happen is you've got the initial wave that comes in. They need their worship. They need their instruction. They need their pastoral oversight in their native language. They're not going to learn English to the point where they can profit from English ministry, but then immediately that next generation, their children are going into the schools and learning the English, and then oftentimes, and this is not just with the Hispanic community, we've seen it with the Mandarin-speaking community in Dayton as well, they don't want to be Spanish anymore, they don't want to be Chinese anymore, they, they want to be American, and so they don't want to be part of, part of this church that sort of um, anchors them culturally. And so Jefferson's particular vision is, is in bridging that gap and ministering to both of those groups. So he's, he's learned Spanish, he's trying to learn English to, to, to better help with that. So I, I got in touch with uh, Jefferson through a sort of circuitous route. Um, I also was talking with an elder at one of the OPC churches in Southern California who said, look, he said, I'm really, really excited about Jefferson's ministry. I really want him to have an opportunity to date, and if that's possible, he said, I'm willing to pay for his whole family to come out for just a visit to see what, what's going on out there. I said, we'll take you up on that. That's great. So Jefferson and his wife Ellen and his two children came in April. They, uh, he ran through the gamut with me. So I'm uh, preaching in, um, first of all, we had a, we had a group of all, a lot of our ESL students over to my house. He got to meet them. He got to speak Spanish with them. And part of that was intel on my part. I wanted to go to them afterwards and said, can you understand what, what he's saying? And there were sort of mixed reviews, uh, depending on what country you were from. I don't know if you know, there's lots of different kinds of Spanish. And there are people from Latin American countries who cannot understand one another. And so we'd have some people that were like, yeah, Spanish is fine. Like, why are you even asking? We had other people who were like, ah, I think he's just speaking Portuguese and trying to pretend it's Spanish. So there was, but that was a, that was a minority. But I was still, you know, not, not really sure about that. So he preached for me at Springfield. At the same time, a part that I've omitted, I was doing a similar ministry in Sydney on Sunday evenings. He came and he preached for me to, uh, for us at that. Um, I had him come to our Cedarville Bible study, which is in English, because I wanted to make him really uncomfortable and just see what happened, and it worked great. Um, but also kind of gauge whether he was a candidate for English-speaking ministry to English-speaking congregations, because Light of the Nation, or Living Water, was also looking for for someone at the time, um, and um, really appreciated what he did. Um, <clears throat> talked with him about some of the possibilities of coming here and what that would look like. The same elder in Southern California got back with me and said, Jefferson had a good time, what do you think? I said, boy, I'd really like to learn more, uh, but I think it's worth looking at. He said, how about if I just fund an internship for him for the summer? <laughs> I said, okay. So we've got, we've got Generous denomination, we have a generous presbytery, and there are just individuals um, who are extremely generous in the church as well. So he, he basically gave us enough money to have Jefferson and his whole family out for, it ended up being two months for the summer, and I had him take over everything that I was doing with respect to the language ministry. I kept the Cedarville and all the other stuff. And the first month I was here with him, watching him, listening to him, listening to him stop pronouncing his rough Hars at the front of his Portuguese words and uh, switching to the trill R in Spanish and listening. Okay, that sounds more like Spanish than Portuguese. Um, but mostly watching the reaction of the people. Jefferson's about my height. He's very round faced. He's very brown and he's very Latino. And before they had even spoken a word to him or heard him preach or anything, I walked in with him and they were like, coming up and like shaking his hand and I was like okay it gave me ging uh, gringo syndrome for sure but it was like okay this matters on the front end to these folks this guy looks like them he sounds like them he hugs like them which I had never seen them hug until he got there I was very jealous of that um 
So Jefferson, he calls, I call him, it's, it's Hefferson and Hefe. He calls me boss. Hefe. He says, so Hefe, what, um, what, what, do I, what do I need to do? What's my goal this summer? I said, okay, you've got one goal. I said, I want them to not want me to come back. I want them to want you to come back instead. He said, okay, that's, that's my first goal. So I came back after the first month. He said, I, I, I think this is going well. We've got a good relationship with them. He said, um, what, what, what else? Like, how do, we, how do we refocus the purpose? And I said, here's the history of what's happened with the Springfield group. Here's the ways that we have uh, approached them about becoming an OPC mission work. Actually, one, one spot of that that I um, skipped, um, their pastor was visiting back in spring. I met with their pa- the Mexican pastor and with James, and we really sort of pushed this with a bit more force than we had in the past and said, look, this is, would really be good for, for these folks, and we're willing to do it. And he said, okay, I'll, I'll talk with them and, and encourage them in that direction. There, uh, we didn't hear what the resolution of that conversation was, but I said, Jefferson, I said, I'm going to Nova Scotia for a month. I said, when I come back, what I want to hear is that they want to be a mission work. He said, okay, got it, Hefe. Well, in the last week in Nova Scotia, I got an email from him and said, we just had our, they have a congregational meeting every Sunday where they talk about the details of everything. He said, I, I presented the, the pros and cons. He said they had a back and forth and they, they, they want to come in. They want to be a mission work of the OPC. So then begins the, we're back to the whole funding process. Um, because again, two things. Normally, an organizing pastor for a mission work starts out at a certain level of support from the denomination and that support then diminishes over time. Um, there are some exceptions to that where the denomination will continue ongoing support for a group that's in a particular um, economic crisis. Neon Kentucky is one of these places that's been on support 10 years now, something like that. So if there's a particular need, they'll, they'll continue that support. Well, we've got, a, um, we've got a, an immigrant population who's not making a lot of money. And so I'm envisioning, okay, this, this is probably one of those scenarios where they're not, they're not going to be um, a completely self-supporting group. Um, one advantage for them is they have living waters building at their disposal um, in perpetuity. I mean, they will always have a place that they don't have to pay for, but still there were some concerns. The other concern was I probably could have, uh, I'll talk about Orlando. Orlando's a really fun uh, thing. I'll talk about Orlando in a minute. But I probably could have come to the denomination and come to the presbytery with a list of signatures explaining or petitioning for them to be a mission work that would have brought in in the spring. I, they would not have been able to sign that, understanding what was happening. I mean, other than, okay, we have this general desire to become a church. So I'm not even in the position where I can really explain what it is they would be committing to. And I didn't want to move forward with them as a mission work before I knew we had somebody on the ground who had spent time with them, who had walked through the process, who explained what an overseeing session was, explained how their membership would work, explained how, um, how the worship would go, and all those sorts of things. So I shooting for the moon, also looking at what we had going on in Dayton and also looking on at what we had going on in Sydney at the time, I, I came to the, our presbytery and asked our presbytery if they would ask the denomination to fund him full-time permanently as an RHM, basically as, a, as another one of, of my roles, but that would, he would focus particularly on the Spanish-speaking population in Western Ohio. So in Columbus and in Springfield and in Sydney and in, in Dayton, that was, that was my ask. Um, I got some really good feedback. So the Presbytery agreed. They made the um, request to the domination. I got some good back channel information, like, you might want to tone that one down just a little bit. So I said, okay. So actually, um, Orlando. Here's what happens in Orlando. Every year, it's called rechecks. And every year, all of the RHMs, all the regional home missionaries, and all the chairmen of all the home missions committees of all the presbyteries get together. Um, we do dog and pony show. We talk about all the great stuff that's happening in our presbytery, all of which is preliminary to saying, can we have some more money, please? So there's this, there's this invisible sort of pot in the middle of the table. And we all go around, and they, they have a list, and they walk through, and they say, how much do you want? And we want this much, and here's why. So that was... Last week, last week in Orlando. So last week in Orlando, I got the, and I should say this, um, those decisions are not final at that point. What happens is the um, general secretary of um, home missions, which you know the the new one of that, and the outgoing general secretary of home missions, and 
um, the associate, they all hear the requests, write them down, sort of give the presbytery sort of advice as to what to ask for, not what to ask for. Then they present it to the, the committee as a whole, and those decisions are made in December. So what I at least got the initial sort of gate to agree to was a one-year funding for Jefferson that's kind of like a one-year RHM position that's not connected with a mission work because we don't have a mission work, but we have a group that wants to become a mission work. So um, I asked, and it seems like it was well-received to have him come for a year. The goal of that year being get, getting them to where they need to be in order to fully understand what they're committing to by becoming a mission work. And then what would happen is that normal four-year um, decreasing scale of support until we figure out where things are going to level out and whether they need continuing support. So I am, to say I'm relieved would, would not even come close. Um, this, this has been something that every, every week I go thinking they need something more than I'm, I'm able to give them. And so I'm very, very much looking forward to that. Okay, I have seven minutes to cover lots more stuff. Um, Louisville, uh, February, one couple called. Hey, we're in Louisville and we think we might be interested in OPC Church. So myself and um, another, we have a, a regional home missions coordinator, a ruling elder, who does all the real work. I just run around and start trouble. Um, we had a Zoom meeting with them and said, what's the church situation on the ground? They explained it. We said, if you go to those churches that are there and um, sort of feel them out and get their perspective on whether another OPC, church, whether another Reformed church would be good for Louisville, um, and they had those conversations. They came back and they said, we are, we're supported by, by um, all those churches. They're, they're on board. We said, okay, if you can get a core group together, then we'll, we'll see what happens. Well, in six weeks, they had a core group. And in six weeks after that, the core group said, we want to become a mission work of the OPC. And we received their petition back in October. They are now a mission work. And <clears throat> what's happening now is that the denomination or the presbytery is before they get an organizing pastor, loaning their RHM to them. And that would be me again. So starting in January, I'll be in Louisville. I have to learn to say it right, but that's where I'll be. Um, Sunday mornings for worship, getting them started. They're already in mission work, but we're just walking them through the initial process of, of worship and going forward. And then I will des desperately be looking for someone to replace me there as their actual organizing pastor. They already have funding. Um, and so they're, they're clear on, the, on that front. Um, that's Louisville. That starts in January. Um, another phenomenon that we've been witnessing in the Presbytery is churches coming in. Um, the first one I'll mention is um, in Newcastle, Indiana. This was a, it was a Church of Christ. And uh, the pastor there um, over time became more and more reformed in his understanding and approached us at some point in time, um, Mike Dirks and I, and said, Here's our situation. What can we do? Um, he was, his credentials were transferred into the OPC. His church was received as a mission work. Um, and more or less, all of them came over. I think they did lose a couple families, but in, in mass, that whole group came over. Building, congregation, organizing pastor. Um, they don't have any elders on the ground yet. That's one of the things that we're, that we're working toward. Um, we had another situation like that. There was a group in Finley, two pastors of a Baptist church in Finley who came to us and said, um, our convictions have, have changed with respect to um, baptism and church government, and um, we're interested in the OPC. What do you think we should do? We said, what's your relationship with your congregation like? We feel like there's a lot of trust. Um, we think, you know, um, if, if we went in this direction, it might it would probably take some time, but we think that the, the congregation would follow us. We said, okay, that sounds great. Um, what's the next step? He said, well, according to our constitution, we have to um, announce if we have any changes in our doctrinal stances. And so that's just in the natural progression and course of things, what, what we have to do next. We said, great, sounds good. Do that. Let us know, you know, how supportive the congregation is. And uh, we got a call the next day after they had the meeting and said, well, <laughs> we presented a situation to the, um, to the congregation. We said, great. Well, so what's, what's the situation? Like, well, we're both unemployed now. <laughs> said, oh, <laughs> Well, so short version of that, two ministers, one of them has moved to Mansfield and is working as an unofficial intern at our Mansfield OPC and is working on the process of transferring his credentials into the OPC. One of the men stayed there 
had some families that were not originally part of the Baptist church that fired them. And then over time, some of those families have come and did follow them. And so now they have a core group. They were recently uh, approved for support. And so hopefully in spring, that support will, will, that's, no, no, that is in Finley now. That's in Finley. Yes. Um, We also have um, an inquiry of the same kind from a place called Fairmont, West Virginia. So there was a pastor, the Newcastle Church. We wrote an article in the New Horizons about that, about that process. This man in West Virginia read that article and said, that's me, that's my situation, and called, and he visited our presbytery meeting, and um, so we're looking at how how to move forward with them. So that's another thing that we haven't seen that much of that really is starting to happen a lot more. Churches with pastors who are coming reformed, congregations who are following them or not, and then those churches coming in as, as new mission works, or depending on their state of development as um, already particularized um, congregations. Um, Gabrielle losing track of what I was talking about brings me to a next point, and that is there's just lots of these right now. Um, we have requested one-third of the entire denominational budget for church planting, Presbyterian Ohio has, out of 17 presbyteries. I was really excited to go to Orlando and like kind of strut that until I realized there was another one who was asking for a little bit more than a third. So we're in second place and what we're asking for from the denomination, but we're in second place out of 17. That's not bad. The problem that this all raises is this. Um, there are, there's uh, denominational funding that comes in, but then for each denominational funding that comes in, there's also a presbytery commitment. Um, so denomination funds some, the presbytery funds additional amount, and the core group funds an additional amount. Um, we, we had a, we had a it, was, it was great. We ended up, the presbytery agreed to everything that, that we asked for as a home missions committee, um, but we're, we're reaching the limit of what we can afford to do without bringing in more money. And so what's happened is that the way that we structure our askings for our churches, the way that we put in front of our churches what's going on and what the money that they're giving to the denomination and the presbytery is going toward. Um, and so we're hopeful for that. We we've, we've, uh, are developing some materials and an approach for that. Um, but it's a, it's a lovely problem to have. Is that basically, we've, the, our, the presbytery of Ohio has, has outworked its, its budget at this point. I think we'll find a way to remedy that. I'm hopeful. I'm confident in that. But that's where we're at right now. Um, you received the email from your session about um, the possibility in Huber. There's still some, uh, didn't include much of what was going on in Sydney, but that's still something that we're, that we're looking at possibly for the future. That's what's going on in the Presbytery of Ohio with respect to church.